Good evening. So I'm going to give a brief uh, introduction to uh, someone very special to Stonybrook. Uh, so Mr. and Mr. Mr. and Mrs. Lockerbie uh, are here with us tonight, and uh, they've been supporters of Stonybrook and uh, lived and worked here for a number of years. And I would like Bruce Lockerbie to come and tell us a little bit about this lecture and the person that the, the lecturer is memorializing, Pearson Curtis. So please welcome Bruce Lockerbie. Pearson Curtis was the most remarkable man any of us ever knew. Uh, he had been born in China. His parents were missionaries. He went to a famous school in China called the Chi Fu School. And from there to Mount Hermon School, uh, where a, a certain alumnus is present in the room this evening, your headmaster. Pearson Curtis graduated in 1909, which is the year that conferences began on this property. He went from Mount Hermon to Princeton University, ran on the track team. He was a sufficiently good enough runner to be in a world's record race in 1913, his senior year. Uh, the world's record was set by John Paul Jones, not the Navy man, but the Cornell runner, who beat the father of one of our most revered English teachers, a woman named Mary Simmons. Her father was Norman Tabor, who was second in that race, and their world record setting time was four minutes and 14 seconds. The world record today is 341. Pearson Curtis was a modest man. He said, I had a very good view of the finish from the rear. <laughs> Uh, he uh, became a qualified main guide, which is no mean accomplishment. He was an inventor. His products are still sold by L.L. Bean. But most of all, he was a master teacher and a godly man. I'll tell you about meeting him. My wife and I arrived in the summer of 1957. Uh, that was another century ago, I realized. When I was still not sure what I was going to be teaching a few days before school began, I began to grow a little nervous. I was told that Pearson Curtis was my department chair, but he wasn't on campus yet. He was still in Maine. He showed up, and he called me across the campus, and I acknowledged my name, and he handed me two very heavy literature anthologies. And one had the number nine on the cover, and the other had the number 10 on the cover, and that was my clue as to what my teaching assignment might be. I said to him, what do I do with these? He spoke four words and walked away. The four words were, make boys love books. And we're here tonight to honor him and to welcome our guests. Thank you, uh, students. Uh, just a just a few housekeeping reminders, right? So some of you have not been attending public lectures very often. Maybe this is a new experience for some of you. I know that most of you are here for uh, some kind of class assignment. Uh, you have teachers that are asking you to do something, take notes. Uh, that's great. I, you know, we're in the age of the computer. I see a lot of open screens. Uh, please just be mindful of the temptations that you're facing. Be mindful of the people behind you who may be distracted by what might be on your screen. Uh, and, uh, and of course, um, make sure that the, the technology you're using to help you take notes is not distracting you uh, or not pulling you away from this evening. Um, so I just, you know, I hope you don't mind giving you a little better reminder. Uh, please uh, be a supportive audience here at Silver tonight. Okay, I'd like to welcome Mark Tichina, who is uh, gonna lead us to our next part of the evening. I'm holding you up right now. It's my pleasure to introduce our speaker. So uh, you are a student, you attended chapel this morning, you had the pleasure of hearing Dr. DeYoung. So Rebecca DeYoung is a professor of philosophy at Calvin College in Grand Rapids, Michigan. 
Um, if you know much about philosophy and Christian philosophy, you may know that uh, uh, Calvin College boasts one of the, if not the finest, Christian philosophy faculty in the country. Um, it's a place that if I could go back in time, I might go study philosophy there as an undergrad. But uh, Dr. DeYoung went to Calvin herself. Uh, her father taught there. And then she did her doctorate in philosophy at the University of Notre Dame. She is an expert in ancient and medieval philosophy, uh, specifically Thomas Aquinas, um, as well as we're going to see tonight, The Seven Deadly Sins. And she has published two books, uh, which I will wave for you at, at you in a moment. Um, two books, one on the seven deadly sins and one on one of those sins, which is called Vainglory. And she's also published in a number of uh, academic journals. Um, one of the things I appreciate about Dr. DeYoung's work is that she um, speaks both to scholars who are impressed with her work and to lay audiences like us uh, who are not professional philosophers who are edified by, by her work as well. Um, so let me wave these at you. Um, tonight and only tonight, we can give you a coupon <laughs> that will uh, give you 30% off the book called Vainglory if you're interested. Uh, there's also a flyer for Literary Vices, which uh, some faculty met last night to talk about that, and uh, it's a delightful book, I highly recommend. She has, uh, she's married and has four children, uh, ages 11 through 18, and so uh, if they were at the Stony Brook School, they would be here as well. Uh, but anyway, please give a warm welcome to Dr. DeYoung. Testing, can you hear me? I feel like I'm up now. Okay. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. I've enjoyed my stay so far at Stony Brook and the conversations I've had with students and faculty alike. And so I just want to thank you for inviting me to be here and to give this lecture um, in honor of uh, a former teacher. I can count myself as someone who also loves books, old books even. Um, so hopefully we'll honor the memory of all those who do. I want to talk tonight about the seven deadly sins, and what I'm hoping to do is to give you an overview of all the, of the project of looking at the seven deadly sins, the seven capital vices, as they're alternately known. And my purpose is not, um, as you might have guessed, to make you feel terribly guilty and then send you home, although that would be fun. Um, I'm not going to do that to you tonight. What I am going to do is try to show you the ways in which this project of exploring the vices came out of the Christian tradition and is framed by the project of spiritual formation. So hopefully you'll leave with a hopeful program for spiritual progress by the time you leave today, even though we're going to start with a very um, serious topic, which is sin. If you have the handout in front of you, you'll know that we're going to go through um, a few points here. I'm going to start out by sort of talking about where the culture is on this topic and where they are is a place that doesn't take sin very seriously. Then we'll counter that with the way that the Christian tradition talks about the seven deadly sins, and they do take it seriously. But we'll note that the seven deadly sins is probably the wrong label to use for the vices, in particular because, as I point out on the handout, there aren't seven of them. They're not best called deadly, and I prefer to call them vices instead of sins. So everything's wrong with the title, and we'll explain that point by point. And last of all, what in the world does this have to do with you and your spiritual formation? So that's where we'll wrap things up. Um, how does this topic actually help us in our walk with Christ and our progress in Christ's likeness? So first, just a few... Um, make sure my clicker's working. There we go. Uh, just a a taste of what our culture uh, does with this topic of sin. And in short, it doesn't take it very seriously. So uh, cartoons that make fun of sloth as kind of napping under the tree and gluttony, eating a few too many donuts. There's even a website, deadlysins.com, devoted to giving you a synopsis, <laughs> thank you, of each one of the sins. And in pride in particular, they say you commit it because your elementary school teachers obviously influenced by the self-esteem movement, told you to believe in yourself. Also, you can buy t-shirts there, depending on which sin you want to show off on a particular day. And that, um, I'm aiming here, here we go. Um, that same website will give you a description of gluttony and include in that description a recipe for double peanut butter paisley brownies, which is not a bad recipe, actually. 
Um, but note the confusion here. It's sort of a toss-off joke about getting fat, joining Overeaters Anonymous. And what they don't tell you is that gluttony is a disorder of the heart, which can afflict both the thin and the not so thin alike. So be aware. Um, but it's going to be made light of on the website. There, toward the, toward the back. there we go. Um, with respect to the sin of sloth, this is my favorite spoof ad for sloth. It reads, <laughs> if the original sin had been sloth, we'd still be in paradise, presumably, because we wouldn't uh, have had enough energy and enough get up and go to commit the really deadly sins like pride and envy. There's a lot of, if you Google on the seven deadly sins, there's a lot of websites devoted to the seven deadly sins of just about everything. There are the seven deadly sins of teachers and students and small group ministry and economics and home remodeling and who knows what else, HR and marketing are the examples that I picked out here. And I have, whoops, I have a seven deadly sins game in my office, which I'll show you here. And it has a set of cards where you do a kind of trivial pursuit about the seven deadly sins. And then when you get to the middle, you have to switch to the sin to win deck and actually commit each of the seven in order to win the game. And if you do win, you can toast your victory with a bottle of Zinfandel called the seven deadly sins. Oh. Or, yeah, no, wrong. Sorry, just I should get my own clicker going here. Zinferno. Yeah, that's the other one. I just found that at Aldi the other day. Places. But anyway, <laughs> somebody bought me a bottle of the Seven Deadly Sins um, for my birthday, and I drank the whole thing myself, but not all of them sitting. That would have been advice. Okay, Seven Deadly Sins wristbands. This is from the Archie McPhee catalog, so you can wear the wristband corresponding to your mood that day and at least warn people off if you're feeling like a hothead by wearing that anger or wrath wristband. Um, so... The Christian tradition is going to try to do a better job with sin than just laughing about it, using it for clever marketing, and all the rest of it. Um, in the book of Proverbs, we get an interesting take on sin, which I want to highlight. This is wisdom literature. Okay, So think about the Greek philosophical tradition, also a kind of wisdom literature. The topic is, how do you live well? What does a flourishing human life look like? And the proverb writer, like the writer of Psalm 1, will tell you there are two ways. There's a way of wisdom and a way of folly. There's a way of flourishing, and then there's a way of destruction. And in this case, it's described as a kind of self-destruction. So sin in this tradition is, is, uh, is an offense against God. It is primarily a self-destructive pattern of living. And that's the kind of focus that I want to um, offer you today. So don't die for lack of discipline. You'll actually lead to your own spiritual death if you keep choosing this way of vice. Um, and notice that it is led by folly. Okay, so N.T. Wright has a lovely quote um, of, that sort of describes the divide. So there are people who don't take sin seriously at all, Christians and others, but then there are other people who do take sin seriously and don't know what in the world to do about it. Um, they still can't kick the habit. And I want to talk about the habitual nature of sin. Um, and my own experience getting into this tradition came through um, an experience reading, of all people, Thomas Aquinas, 13th century theologian. And I was in graduate school and struggling with difficulty and climate issues and all the rest of it. And found myself thinking, do I really belong here? Can I really persevere through this? Um, and a little overwhelmed by a sense of my own inadequacy. And if any of you have gone to grad school, maybe you've shared those kinds of feelings at some point along your process, very likely so. So as I'm tearing my hair out and feeling inadequate, I came across a vice Thomas Aquinas writes about, and it's called pusillanimity. Okay, everybody say that three times really quickly. Pusillanimity has to do with fearing your own failure, and therefore shrinking back from whatever God is calling you to do. So think of Moses at the burning bush. God shows up. Moses, you're on holy ground. Let's get these people out of Egypt. We're going to do the big rescue from slavery. And Moses' response is, what? Me? No, I, I 
can't do that. Son Aaron, I stutter, excuses, excuses, I can't, I can't, I'm worried about the whole project. And God says, this isn't about your power, Moses. This is about my power. This is going to be a display of my rescue. So if I call you to this work, I will be faithful and help you carry it out. And so the cure for this habit of pusillanimous shrinking back is to rely more on God's power. And so there's a spiritual discipline that goes with this vice, and it's called Sabbath keeping. Maybe you've heard of it. And the, the idea behind Sabbath keeping is it is one day of the week, among other things, it's one day of the week where I lay down my own work, my own performance, my own achievement, and I rest in the knowledge that I'm part of God's kingdom and he gives the power behind the work. So this tradition named a vice for me that was kind of an eye-opener. Have you ever had an experience where you're kind of struggling with something, but you can't put a figure on, finger on what's wrong, and you get a name for what's wrong? And you're like, oh, that's what it is. And it's almost like an epiphany or a liberating moment. And then if the person who pinpoints what's wrong actually also offers you a solution to your problem or a spiritual practice that offers you a way forward, a better way, what a relief it is. And so my experience of that pattern of naming um, what my struggle was, where my area of weakness was, and also finding a better path, a better practice going forward, is I think the gift of the, this particular tradition and a gift that I want to explore with you today. So this gift comes from the desert, the Desert Fathers in particular. Evagrius of Pontus and John Cassian were two of the, the people who first wrote down sort of the program that was going on in the desert. And they're the ones who in, um, basically practiced and then wrote down the practice of self-examination via the seven deadly sins. So let's look at what they give us in terms of a list. How many are there? Clue, it's not seven. <laughs> Count them up. Yeah, so for Evagrius, it was actually eight evil thoughts. Later ones got added, some got taken off. What's the story here? Is there some magic to the number seven? No, not really. You can think of this more as a kind of top 10 list of things most human beings struggle with at some point in their life. All right, and you may struggle with some more than others. So the number of items on the list is not that important. It was more just a later development to hone it down to seven so it fit with the seven of everything else that was in the catechism, right? There are seven petitions for this prayer and seven virtues and seven this and that and the other thing. So we needed to shave the list down to seven to make it fit. But originally it was kind of a, you know, a, a kind of rule of thumb, general counseling observations kind of list. And um, sometimes it was organized from vices with a physical object, like lust and gluttony, to vices with a spiritual object um, at the end of the line, like vainglory and pride. Um, and this should read habit, not tradition, actually, because the list of vices is meant to name things that human beings, being as foolish as they perennially are, keep stumbling over. So if you were going to give someone a lesson in the school of life, you'd say, hey, here's eight things to watch out for, or nine things, or however many you want to put on your list. Okay? So the, the Desert Fathers weren't trying to paint these as the worst possible things you could do. They were trying to say, look, these are perennial stumbling blocks. Let's be aware and, and then strategize about how to live our lives in ways that we don't stumble. All right, so why call them capital vices instead of deadly sins? In part because this deadly conjures up the wrong, um, the wrong name for the list. The list was originally brought up to pick out vices that function as the tradition called it source sins. So capital from the Latin, um, what, what do we mean by a source vice? It's a vice from which other vices spring. So pride is supposed to be the root of the rest of them. So pride being the original sin, um, Adam and Eve in the garden. And then the other vices spring from that. And then they give rise to a whole slew of other vices. And we'll look at um, how that is supposed to work. Cassian's description, he has several metaphors that he uses to describe these sins as source vices or source sins. Um, he says it's like the root of a tree. Think of sin as organic, 
right? It's not just going to kind of sit there inert in your life. It's going to keep growing and keep growing and keep growing. Um, if your tree of vice is bearing lots of fruit, it's not going to solve the problem to pick more fruit and pick fruit more often. Your tree is just going to keep growing more stuff. And in fact, it's going to keep growing bigger and bigger and bigger. So the idea is that if that's the dynamic we have with respect to sin, then we need to cut off the branches, cut the tree down, and then grind the stump. We need to get down to the root of things. And so the picture of moral education here is we need to get down to the source of the problem, not just sort of pick off the symptoms. Okay? And likewise, the poison spring, the idea that if you, if you poison the source, it's going to carry the water through every tributary and poison all the land around. Besides. So let's get to the root of the problem. Here's the general uh, pattern here, pride being the root, ultimately, and that sort of comes straight out of the Augustinian tradition. Here's one of my favorite pictures from the British Library's collection of illuminated manuscripts, and this is the tree of the vices. You can see Adam and Eve at the bottom there with the snake, symbolizing pride, that original moment of saying no to God. And then there are vices that spring from that root. So here's one main branch, this is avarice. And this, another main branch, this is envy. And you can see that the fruit, the branches growing from that are all drooping down, symbolizing their sort of lowering us, descending into um, hellish territory, as it were. So the tree of vices is countered by a tree of virtues. Um, and you can see the contrast here. The root of the tree of virtues is Mary at the Annunciation, who says yes to God when he calls her to be all that um, he wants her to be. And so her tree, the tree of humility, then grows corresponding fruit, the fruit of the virtues. And you notice all the fruit here is growing up toward Christ, the head. So if you are rooted in Christ, you will be built up and grow up into Christ-likeness. So those are the pictures of sin and of virtue, of vice and virtue, that the tradition offers. Now, why pick out these seven? What's so special about these seven, eight, nine, however many you want to keep on your list? Well, the answer that this tradition gives, and especially this is coming from Aquinas, he wants to say, these particular vices we want to pick out because they go after good things, created things, that look like happiness that captivate our hearts, that we think, if I get enough of this thing, I can make my own fulfillment. Right? So take some created good thing, put it in the place of God, and pursue it for a lifetime, build your life around it, and you've got a recipe for a capital vice. Right? And the idea is, anytime you try to find a finite thing and plug it into an infinite hole in your heart, you're going to have to keep going back and keep going back and keep going back for more. So there's this kind of more, more, more dynamic, which means most of the vices have to do with excessive desire. So here's Calvin and Hobbes, the expert on sin and vice, if there ever was one. Um, he says to Hobbes, getting is better than having. When you get something, it's new and exciting. When you have something, it's boring. Take it for granted. But, says Hobbes, everything that you get turns into something that you have. And that's why Calvin says you always need to get more, get new things, all right? So there's that dynamic of more, 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 and this is as old as Augustine, right? Our hearts are restless. Why? Because we're pursuing things that won't fill us and that won't fulfill us, so we keep going back for more and more and more until we find our rest in the infinite good that is God. Now, lastly, we don't have seven, we have eight or nine. We've talked about how they're capital, not deadly, not the worst things that you can do. They're just sore spices, okay? And I, now I want to talk about the habitual nature of sin. Why, why focus on something that's a vice instead of the word sin? Sin can name lots of different things. It can name habitual patterns of wrongdoing. It can also name individual actions. Did you commit a sin? And it can also name our fallen human nature in general, our general sinful condition. So vice is a term that picks out that middle ground, that dispositional character trait territory. So we're really talking about sin as it accumulates into patterns in our character. Right? So think about 
um, vice as akin to uh, a chronic disease, right? Something that kind of affects all of you that's long-term, pervasive, holistic, that requires treatment over the long haul, rather than something like a broken arm where you know you, you put a cast on and six weeks you're good to go. It's it's that kind of it's going to affect the way that you see the world. It's going to affect the way that your emotions are attuned to reality, and it's going to affect um, the kind of behavior and, uh, that we can expect of you. So it's dispositional. Uh, and Cassian is probably the most winsome spokesperson here with respect to what this seven deadly sins, eight capital vices tradition has to do with your spiritual formation. Because the whole point for Cassian of Agris and others of identifying these vices through the process of self-examination and confession then, the whole point of identifying those vices was to move us from destructive patterns of living to what he calls health in the future. This is a spiritual, healthy wellness program for your life in Christ. Okay, So he describes the spiritual directors in this community as sort of physician's assistants to Jesus Christ, who is the great physician. So the idea is we're going to probe and diagnose in order to do some heart surgery on you in order to make your heart better, right? in order to give you health in the future. And so the, the medical metaphor that he uses here isn't, I, I think, the trite therapeutic um, views that we sometimes get in today's culture. It's sort of, this is going to be deep, painful heart surgery, um, but you're entrusting yourself to the physician of souls. Um, so let's get you healthy and moving in a more positive direction. Here we go. I listen to slide, but anyway, we'll just move on. The the exercise that I do to illuminate this with my students to sort of bring forward this shift between our old self-destructive way of living and our new um, health in Christ way of living is to have my students write their own eulogy. So first day of ethics class with Dr. DeYoung, you walk into class and I have you write the speech you would give at your funeral if you could be there. So imagine a good friend or a loved one writing the speech that would be given about you if you died today. What would it look like? What would they say? Hopefully it would say a few good things, but there's also some um, territory they might tread lightly in a funeral speech about because it, there was still some rehabilitation needed. Why the funeral speech? In part because what eulogies do is they describe who you were as a person, what your character is like. Um, you know, if we get a retirement speech or a graduation speech, it's going to be about what you've accomplished. Was your life successful in terms of performance and achievement? Whereas a funeral speech is going to be more about who were you and what did you become and what kind of character did you have? And character language is language we just don't use very often in American culture um, these days. So funerals are sometimes the only places where we still think about what kind of person am I becoming? Um, what kind of person have I been so far? Now, as my students write that first speech, I also ask them on the last day of class to write a second speech. The second speech is, how would I like that speech to have read? if I had become everything that God had called me to be. And obviously there's going to be a gap here between who you are now, how your character is formed currently, and then all the ways that you still have to grow into Christ-likeness. Right? There's this gap, at least there is in my life, um, there's a gap between what is now and what is not yet. So the way the Bible talks about this, especially in the New Testament, is going to be to frame this in terms of sanctification. Um, you're being made new in Christ, but that's a lifelong journey. That's a lifelong process of character transformation. So when Paul talks in what I call the transformation text, Colossians 3, Ephesians 4, the fruit of the Spirit in Galatians 5, and then Romans 12 at the beginning, um, do not be uh, conformed by the, uh, 
by the world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. He's talking about taking off the old self with its practices, with its old habits, and putting on the new self, which is called to be a new creation in Christ. And you're called to Christ-like qualities, which sure sound like virtues, things like kindness and patience and self-control and godliness and faithfulness and so on. So that language of putting off the old sinful habits and taking on new Christ-like habits can be, I think, very helpfully captured in terms of this virtue-vice distinction. But this takes a process of discipline and change, right? This is Carl in one of my favorite cartoons called Copy of Jesus. He says, I love being a believer in you, Jesus. You're a good friend. And I like that you're a believer, Carl. But I'd prefer you to be a disciple. What's the difference? Discipline. Be a disciplined disciple. What does that look like? Because you don't just become a believer and then have the Holy Spirit sprinkle some pixie dust on you while you lay on the couch eating chips and watching the latest episode of whatever, right? There, the spiritual life is a mode of living. It involves practices. And the question is, how are our practices, how is our living transformed in ways that transform our character? Be clear here, and especially with the Protestant audience, I want to be exceptionally clear, this is not a spiritual self-help program. Right? As Americans, we do self-help better than anybody. All right? And we have self-help books about self-help books, practically. Right? So this is not a go team, get out there and be a better Christian kind of program. That is you taking control of your own sanctification. Not right. All right? That is not what we're advocating here. What we're advocating is engagement in spiritual disciplines, which are really a kind of um, program designed to open your hands to God's grace and say, wherever I need to be transformed, Lord, I'm ready and I'm open. Take the practice of silence that I talked about this morning in chapel. When you shut down your own agenda and your own image making, you're finally open to what God would speak to you about what he wants you to be. And unless you quiet yourself down and open your hands and open your ears, you're not going to be ready to receive that. So the spiritual disciplines are going to try to cut a narrow path in between good old-fashioned works righteousness, work out, be a better Christian, achieve health by, you know, your own willpower on the one hand, and then a kind of cheap grace on the other, where you're like, hey, Jesus is going to do everything, so I'm just sitting here and do nothing. Right? And you want to keep both of those options at bay and forge this middle ground where divine and human agency get sort of tangled together in this intimate communion we call spiritual disciplines. So the goal of the spiritual disciplines isn't more hard work. Does it feel like homework? Sometimes it feels like discipline, right? Sometimes it's hard at the beginning. But the goal is freedom. In the same way that when you become proficient in a practice, an athletic practice or a musical instrument, with proficiency comes joy, comes freedom, comes um, the kind of pleasure that goes along with doing something well. And that's the goal of the spiritual disciplines. The idea is to be open-handed before God so that he can catalyze that transforming work in us. And the transformation that they're calling us to is not limited to Sunday worship, chapel, devotion time. Right? When you take communion in church, and when you engage in Lenten fasting, those practices, those rhythms of life, of fasting and feasting, for example, are supposed to pervade all of your eating and consumption in a fasting and feasting model. So what you do in the cafeteria should be affected by taking communion on Sunday. These things should be a seamless practice in your life, not something that gets sequestered on Sunday. So, Try to think about the spiritual disciplines as um, pervading all of your life. There are Christian practices, that is, that are catalyzed by grace and made possible by grace. That's the pusillanimity story. Um, they're comprehensive. They're meant to cover everything you do. And this is why the language of habit formation and virtue and vice is so helpful here. 
They're going to affect your habits of speaking and your habits of listening, your habits of working and your habits of resting, right? your habits of consumption and your habits of refraining from consumption, your habits of celebrating and your habits of confessing. Okay? They're supposed to cover the whole territory that is your human life. And let me be clear, the spiritual disciplines are meant to be corporately practiced. You're not supposed to be a spiritual lone ranger. Um, the idea behind the disciplines is that there are disciplines that the church engages in, and they're a way of um, crafting our character, not only as individuals, but as a community that reflects Christ-like virtue. So why study the vices? It might just be, oh, well, there's this crazy historical stuff and the Desert Fathers and a bunch of medieval theologians. Is it just archaic history? I don't think so. I think what these people who originally came up with the idea behind the seven deadly sins were all about was teaching us what it's like to walk in the way of Christ-likeness. They're interested in the kind of spiritual formation that spans the ages and that's still fresh and relevant for us today. I think they're teaching us the way of Christ-likeness, the way of wisdom. Um, and that rhythm then will be naming your vices in order to free you from those patterns of temptation and weakness and moving you toward a healthy pattern of Christ-like living and spiritual health. So regeneration and renewal. God is for you and he wants you to live well and he wants you to live for him. And that's the life that he's calling us toward. So when we talk about vice, it's not to bog ourselves down in sin and shame, but rather it's a call to make a new beginning. And I'll just close with this um, poem by Madeline Lingle. In flesh of solitude, I count it blessed that only you, Lord, can see my heart. With passions, t darkness tearing it apart, with storms of self and tempests of unrest. But your love breaks through my blackness bursts in light. We separate ourselves, but you rebind in day spring all our fragments, body, mind, and spirit join, unite against the night. Healed by your love, corruption and decay are turned and whole who greet the light of day. Thank you very much. So we have um, a few minutes for questions, um, and I think uh, I'd like to open that up. So if you would like to field your own question. Sure, absolutely. And yes. my students, I know that you have questions. Yeah, we should let the seniors go first. <laughs> yes, I saw a hand. Yeah, go ahead. Good, thank you. So you were paying attention when I flipped the list up there. And dejection or justitia is one of the original vices. And you do not in any way want to confuse this with the general emotion of sadness, which you can feel appropriately on many occasions. You certainly don't want to confuse it with depression. Um, so what is the sadness that they're referring to? In the desert tradition, these guys would leave their city behind, their family behind, their profession behind, and all their money behind. They would head out into the desert to try to practice spiritual disciplines in order to um, achieve what they called pure prayer, or basically communion with God. And sadness was the, the vice of not really being able to leave that old life behind, of being unhappy with the renunciation required of you, all the things that you had to give up. So it's a kind of incomplete detachment from all the worldly goods that were part of your old life that you're trying to wean yourself off from and turn toward God. And so it's the sadness characteristic of that renunciation. Cassian will call it a response to incomplete renunciation. So that's, that's the target for that particular one. Good to clarify that. Because the last thing I ever want to do is confuse healthy emotions with <laughs> particular vices. Yes? Um, how does that feel? How are you based on that mindset? Hmm. 
Yeah, so what do, you, what do you do if you're not part of this whole spiritual formation, Christ-likeness stuff? What, what can you say about this? Um, actually, there's, there's plenty of literature out there that talks about vice from a non-Christian perspective. And I think you can still have what I would call a eudaimonist perspective about there are certain ways of living that, that work well for human beings, and there are certain ways of living that lead to brokenness and hurt and harm and you know, psychological damage and physical damage even. Um, so I don't think we need necessarily to frame it in terms of Christ-likeness, although I think that's the richest and most accurate way to put it. Um, we can frame the vice to virtue as moral transformation, for example. Um, and I'll give you an example of this. I work in a prison in Louisiana and do some teaching down there. And when they, when they talk to um, you know, the news media or the state about what they're doing with prisoners there um, in terms of education, they call it moral education. But that transformative process, they'll also tell you, sort of behind the scenes, would go very little way without the kind of revival that's also happening in the prison and the movement of the Holy Spirit. So while I would never want to discourage anyone from good moral practice, I would also want to say that there's only so much you can do in your own power to break the power of destructive habits. So there's kind of a both and there. I want to acknowledge what can be said, I think, um, fruitfully from a non-Christian perspective, but note that if it turns into another self-help program, um, I'm going to worry about the results. Good question. Yes? Yeah, so what's with that? Um, well, let's blame Augustine for that idea. Um, the idea behind the pride here, and I actually think it's a very good idea. His, his story about pride is that it's not so much a distinctive vice on its own, in its own right, but rather it's the description of the pattern of all the other vices. So it's the pattern of saying two things to God. I don't want what you want. I'm going to go for my picture of happiness instead. And I'm not going to do it dependent on you and your power. I'm going to do it on my own power. So you can hear the prideful disobedience and also the willfulness and also that I'm going to do it on my own. So the lack of dependence. So in that respect, no matter what you put in place of God, it's the same pattern of saying no to God and yes to some created thing, but on my own power, on my own terms. So you hear the I, I, me, me, don't need you dynamic. And that's what makes all of them prideful. And that's why pride is named as the root. Good question. Yes, I got a bunch of them. I can't see everybody in these lights. One in the front and then a couple in the back. We'll try to go in order here. So, um, so on the list, uh, pride is listed as the one of the seven sins. Mm -hmm. And um, you said that studying uh, vices can teach us the way to wisdom. So, I mean, sometimes people need um, a little bit of pride when they're doing the things that they need to be confident. Yes. And um, mm -hmm. so does, um, like, advice can teach us the way to wisdom. Does wisdom mean to not be, uh, does wisdom mean to not be pride or? Yeah, so do wisdom and humility go together and folly and pride go together? Um, one of the first things that you said in your comment is that don't we need the confidence first? And so I think you're hinting at the idea that there's a kind of proper self-regard here and a proper self-love. Um, it's not that pride names all forms of self-regard or all senses of self-worth. Clearly we need some of that. But the idea behind pride is that um, pride, the term pride is going to have to name the disordered version of that. The idea when we're, we're so confident of ourselves that we think we don't need God rather than having the proper confidence, um, which I would say comes with a very healthy um, and, uh, and utter reliance on God for all things. So in that respect, I think the right and wise proper self-regard is actually, I'm going to call it humility. Like, I'm a child of God, I'm infinitely precious in his sight, and I'm going to rely on him for absolutely everything because I'm nothing without him. Can you say all those things in the same breath? I think you can. Um, so pride is going to name the toxic or the vicious kind of part of that. Yes, a couple back here. Yes, sir. Uh, could you explain more about the relationship between the three different sins and communities? And communities? Sure. So um, start with an example.
table. Have you ever prayed together in a small group? Prayed for each other in a community? And especially in a small group setting. Christ says, where two or three are gathered in my name, I also am with them. So my sense is that I can pray on my own, but I also need corporate prayer in Christian worship, and I also need other people to pray with and to pray for me. And so that's a, it's both an individual practice and a communal practice. And that's a model that I would want to use for all the spiritual disciplines. Um, you can fast on your own, but there's something really powerful about being part of a community that's all fasting during Lent. So there's a kind of solidarity in the practice there. And you know that when you're studying for a really, really hard physics test, right, if you have study buddies, everything goes better for everyone, right? And there's also a kind of encouragement and a solidarity in the practice. There's also accountability in the practice, and it all goes better together. And the spiritual disciplines are supposed to track that kind of model. It's supposed to be things we do together. I have a couple more here. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, so quick, the gluttony chapter in five seconds or less. Um, what is gluttony? Does it have to just do with overconsumption, and does it just have to do with overconsumption of food and drink? Um, short answer, no and no. Okay? Um, gluttony has to do with the excessive desire for pleasure and the specific pleasures associated with touch and taste. And so gluttony, gluttony and lust will be sort of twin vices under that description. So, I mean, I think there are certain forms of drug use that might count as a form of gluttony um, under, you know, under certain circumstances because they give you a certain kind of tactile or physical pleasure. Um, and it doesn't necessarily have to do with overconsumption. It has to do with excessive desire. So you can have an excessive desire for a good that causes you to consume less, not more, because maybe you want only the very best for yourself. So you're only willing to eat, you know, the middle of the cheeseburger where all the cheese is still gooey and all the pickles are. You're going to leave that dry, crusty stuff on the outside and just throw that away, right? But that kind of concern with the pleasure of eating could be gluttonous even if it's not excessive in amount. So there's actually five different forms of gluttony. There's one for everyone. <laughs> Lots of different ways to be gluttonous. Um, and there's plenty more to read in the chapter on that topic. That's a great question. Thank you. Yes, one in the back. Can you explain further how time blocks would be a gluttony for a month? How to find a vice in your own life? Mm -hmm. Oh, the root. Okay, great question. Again, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go to community. Um, this whole tradition did not try to do self examination in a vacuum. They were out in the desert in a Christian community of monks who knew each other well, and they were masters and apprentices in the program. So they're called the Desert Fathers because there were certain members of the community who were spiritual directors or spiritual fathers of the rest of the folks there who were their children or their flock or use whatever metaphor you want. So I would recommend being a part of a a corporate worshiping community and being a long-term member, right? If you just bop around, people don't get to know you very well and you can hide all the bad stuff. So like a family, a church is a family, you hang around long enough and all your stuff is out there, right? Everybody knows exactly how to push your buttons, exactly what sets you off, exactly um, what your problems are. So be in a long-term community of believers. Also have some kind of small group or accountability group and if possible, get a spiritual director. So this tradition availed themselves of all those different layers of accountability. And I would suggest that, especially the Protestant community, um, we've got a lot of work to do in sort of building up those layers of accountability and insight again. So a spiritual director is not a therapist or a counselor. Therapists and counselors are very important, very helpful, um, have many insights. But a spiritual director is someone who is trained to look at the way God is moving in your life and the ways in which you're resisting him and opening yourself up to him. And that kind of training um, is, is still done in the Catholic tradition, and I think it's something that um, is a really useful spiritual practice. I think, Henry, did you have one? Uh -huh. How sad would it feel to have been healed? 
How would sadness look like for us? You're coming back to the dejection question. Um, so here's, here's a one way it might work. Um, I talked this morning in chapel about how the spiritual disciplines typically have this kind of twofold movement. There's a kind of detachment from disordered desire at the same time that there's attachment to the right kind of goods and the right kinds of ways. And that dynamic is characteristic of most of the, the spiritual disciplines. So Sabbath keeping detaches you from reliance on your own performance and your own effort and it attaches you to a reliance on God's work for his kingdom and his kingdom purposes. And I think the sadness often comes with the detachment side of a spiritual practice. Whenever you're detaching from something that you've relied on for an awfully long time to make you feel good about yourself, that's going to cause sadness. And it might even feel like an existential crisis in many cases. Um, if, if you talk to people who are trying to practice, say, silence or solitude for the first time, they might sit in silence and solitude, you know, maybe they're 20 minutes a day or whatever, and just go crazy for about a year and not feel like anything is happening, feel like it's a waste of time, or even get angry about doing it. Okay, sadness is the dynamic that's going on there. As things are being pulled away, um, you're going to not know who you are and how to function, and you're going to miss the old, comfortable, familiar you. So that's the dynamic I think that's going on. Yes? Yes, absolutely it should. Should Vainglory be added back into the list? I'm 100% yes on that one. Um, I'm a huge fan of naming that one, especially in our culture. We are image obsessed. And we're also obsessed with spectacle and sensationalizing everything and hype and performance and uh, prestige and honor and records of success. And I think we need to get over ourselves. So Vainglory would be, I think, an essential piece an essential tool to have in our toolkit, our spiritual toolkit these days, for naming the ways in which we get caught up in that. Right? And you don't have to be a celebrity, obviously. Um, you can be an ordinary Christian and still have major issues with being glory. And I think it would actually do, do our culture a favor if the Christian church took the lead on that one. Um, and rather than just pointing fingers at um, the Kardashians that we pointed a finger inward and said, you know, we're going to do some self-examination on this vice and look at the ways in which um, we can be um, people who are um, willing to let our weakness show and, um, and therefore be in solidarity with other people who are struggling with weakness as well. Yes, Fiona. Yeah, so this tradition inherits virtue vice talk from the Greek tradition, but Aristotle wants to locate a vice of excess and a vice of deficiency. And this capital vice tradition is focusing primarily on the vice of excess, right, as opposed to the proper appreciation of some particular good. So the way that, um, that I would characterize the commonality between the two systems is that there's two ways to think about created goodness. One is to be insufficiently appreciative of it. And one is to be so attached to it you make it an idol. So I think there's a way of casting this tradition um, in more Aristotelian terms and having a vice on each side. Um, I think the comment about human nature that I would make that aligns with this tradition also aligns with Aristotle's comments about pleasure or anything good. We tend to err on the side of excess. So as a human being, you should just kind of lean away from excess and you'd probably be more likely to hit the mean. And I think this tradition is saying something similar. We tend to excessively attach to created things. That's typically more of a human problem than insufficiently attaching. Mm -hmm. Although there are certainly, I think, some notable exceptions. Yes? Could you pronounce your vice again, and then I'll ask you a question about it. Pusillanimity. Oh, okay, that. Yes. Um, <laughs> Smallness of soul. Literally translated from the Latin. So when you, this is a personal question. I hope you don't mind me asking in front of all these No, people. that's fine. When you experienced that revelation, mm -hmm. what did you do 
Like, what was the next thing that you did to counteract the baseline? Yeah. Um, well, I think the first thing that was helpful to me was to hear it named as something certain biblical figures had struggled with and who had found a way to move beyond, who had found their way toward um, a more spiritually healthy way of living. So the first thought is, oh my goodness, I have a name for my problem, and also lots of other people struggle with this, and t they turned out fine. God can work with them, so maybe he can work with me too. Um, the first practice was Sabbath keeping, and I, so the form of Sabbath keeping that I practiced was no graduate school work for a 24 hour period. And I had, you know, all your peers, of course, who seem smarter than you to begin with, are all working 24 seven as much as possible, trying to elbow their way up through the system. And I had to get out of the competitive game. So I kind of had my touchstone reversed from Thessalonians. He who is called to this faithful and he'll do it. Mm. So if he's called you to this, you're gonna have to count on him to be faithful. And that means you be faithful to him and then he'll be faithful to help you carry it out. And I about went crazy trying to keep the Sabbath for the first couple months. I could not stand it. I'd sit there all day thinking about what I could be doing and all the work I'm getting behind on. And yeah, it, it's that, that letting go. You've patterned your life that way for years and you've been rewarded for it, socially rewarded for it and all the rest of it. That's how I got into grad school. Um, and now I had to lay that down. What? What are you doing to me, Lord? Um, and what I discovered is that now, um, and very um, soon into my grad school work, I found that I got about three times as much done on Monday and Tuesday if I actually took the rest. Um, I slept enough on that day that I could actually remember things on Monday and remember them better. And now I can't live without it. I can't imagine life without that breathing space. And so eventually it became not this agonizing discipline, but this path of freedom where I was like, oh, I can't wait till Sunday. I can lay my stuff down um, and just rest in this work. And again, th some of that is not just, oh, I just want a break. You could get a break by watching TV, right? Um, but the break is the performance anxiety that it all rests the term disciple, um, as Jesus was, I think. I mean, look at his disciples. <laughs> Read the whole New Testament um, and realize how generous the term is, right? I mean, I think it's a little bit like, think of God as a parent. Um, you might be the spiritual equivalent of a two-year-old throwing a temper tantrum, and he still wants to love you into maturity. Um, so wherever you are in your spiritual journey, um, as long as you hold on to him, and as long as you look to him for the way forward, I think he's going to be thrilled to count you as a disciple. And um, I will mention that, I mean, God is generous with us in the sense that even in our weakness and even in our failure, um, if we seek to honor him and we turn back to him, he can use everything we've given, including our mistakes. Mm -hmm. So there's some grace, I think, in that way forward. Thank you very much for coming out tonight. Thank you.